Good afternoon. We're going to let folks trickle in as we've just opened up the waiting room. Good afternoon and welcome to Civil and Human Rights in the Next Four Years, a panel discussion co-sponsored by Freedom House and the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I'm Jill Savitt, the CEO of the Center. We are a museum and rights organization based in Atlanta. We harness the power of history to make sure people have the capacity to protect and promote civil and human rights. We have four terrific panelists with us today, two experts on civil and human rights from the national and international perspective, Michael Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House, and Andrea Young, the executive director of the ACLU of Georgia. We also have two frontline activists, Joey Su of Hong Kong Watch, who has been involved in the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong, and Janetta Elzi, a co-founder of Campaign Zero and an organizer with We the Protesters. Janetta became involved in organizing against police brutality after the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. To give our viewers some context, I'd like to ask each of you, each of our panelists, to introduce yourselves and your organizations with some additional details. We'll go around the panel and um, please take a few minutes just to say what you or your organization does to protect democratic practice and civil and human rights. Andrea Young, we'll start with you. Andrea, you might be on mute. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I'm Andrea Young. Uh, I'm the executive director of the ACLU of Georgia. Uh, I am a native uh, of Georgia and um, uh, very involved in the center uh, from its inception. Uh, and at the ACLU, we're very focused. You know, we are the Georgia affiliate of the national organization and we're very focused on civil rights and civil liberties. For us, uh, we've been relentlessly focused on voting rights uh, for the last four years. Great, thank you. Mike Abramowitz of Freedom House. Thank you, Jill. And it's great to be with you and the panelists. I wanna particularly thank the National Center for Civil and Human Rights for being our partner in this event. You know, we're very proud of that partnership. I'm particularly proud, if I might say, that our, our famous Freedom Map is on display uh, in your museum. Uh, and I'm really proud of that uh, presence there. Freedom House, we're 80 years old. We, we started in 1941, uh, among our founding co-chair uh, patrons was Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, Wendell Wilkie, who had run against Eleanor's husband for president in 1940. I often speak of that because it really shows how people of uh, different political orientation can come together for the cause of freedom and for the cause of democracy. Uh, we are a pro-democracy group. We really do three things. Uh, we document the erosion of democracy around the world. Uh, well, sometimes we document the improvements, but in the last 10 or 15 years, it's been declining. Uh, we advocate for governmental policies to address those uh, declines. And we also work overseas uh, with uh, on the ground activists in, in many different countries who are struggling uh, for their freedom. Uh, we help amplify their voices and we help uh, uh, work in solidarity with them to uh, uh, to make sure they're protected uh, in a time of great danger for activists. Great, thanks, Mike. Janetta Elzi. Hi, everybody. I'm Janetta, a Campaign Zero co-founder and a Ferguson protester. Uh, I was I left my house in August of 2014 and seem to have never went back. Um, just dedicating my life to eradicating police violence from my city. Um, I've lost close friends to police violence. And as I continue to do this work with Campaign Zero, we are trying to level out um, police violence and live in a world where, where no one has to die at the hands of the police. So happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Johnetta. And then our final panelist, Joey Sue. Hi everyone, this is Joey and I'm a student activist from Hong Kong and currently based in the US. And then back in Hong Kong, I worked with different student organizations, including the Student Union of the City University of Hong Kong and also the Hong Kong International Affairs Students Delegation. And we 
Our, our objective was to unite the efforts of different student bodies in Hong Kong to be the voice of youth, to be the voice of university students, and also to make the best use of our role as a student and also as the future of Hong Kong. And currently I'm working with Hong Kong Watch and also the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. And for Hong Kong Watch, we monitor the human rights conditions in Hong Kong, and we provide briefings to policymakers across the globe. We advocate for effective, efficient, and also concrete policy changes that would help defend the freedom and democracy of the people of Hong Kong. And we also communicate and connect different Hong Kong diasporas across the globe and to project the voices of Hong Kongers who are still in the city or across the globe. So that is basically the things I'm, that I'm working on right now. And thank you so much for having me today. Great, thank you. So that gives everyone who's listening in a sense of who our panelists are and the perspective that they're gonna come from. So I think we should just jump right in. Let's start with priorities. There's a new administration in the United States, one that has made civil and human rights a core of its agenda during the presidential campaign. We are now roughly a month into the new administration. What progress have you seen so far on human rights and what issues would you like to spotlight as priorities you wish that you were seeing? Um, Mike, let's start with you. Thank you, Jill. It, well, it's certainly kind of early in the administration. It's only been about a month. So it's a little too early to give you a kind of definitive assessment. Let me make a couple points. One thing that I think is very interesting about the Biden administration is that they have really made it clear that they see a linkage between democracy at home and democracy abroad. Uh, that they, uh, it's not either or. Uh, they see that uh, that we have to have a vital and strong democracy in our own country while we're also supporting uh, democracy overseas. And I just noticed, by the way, just before hopping on this call, that you know the president made a very significant speech uh, with, uh, at the Munich Security Forum uh, in which he really you know, laid down a marker, apparently, about uh, his concerns about the erosion of democracy, uh, both at home and abroad. So that's very interesting. I'm going to be eager to dig into that whole speech. Uh, I'm gonna just address a couple points on foreign policy, because I know my colleagues may have more to say on the domestic front, but I think, you know, we see early on at Freedom House some, some very good signs, uh, you know, just something simple is that the administration has kind of restored regular press briefings, uh, which I think is an important signal that, you know, they take seriously uh, the, uh, the importance of a free press as a, as a, as a, as a as, a, as an institution that is there to hold uh, governments accountable. Uh, we have seen strong statements from the administration on the human rights issues in countries like Turkey, Hungary, Nicaragua, China. Uh, the administration has also said that they're going to uh, re-engage with, with, with the United Nations Human Rights Council, which we think is uh, you know, very important because you, know, you can't be fighting for human rights if you're not engaging with the institutions that are actually there. And, and with the United States being absent from that council, it has kind of ceded the grounds to countries like China uh, who you know, really have kind of a, an attitude that's hostile to human rights. So you know, I would say, Jill, that in general, uh, I think we're, we're kind of optimistic about the way the Biden administration is going, but you know, it's a four year term and there's a lot of, the rubber's gonna hit the road and they're gonna you know, find that the efforts to promote uh, human rights and civil rights are gonna conflict with the other parts of their agenda. Great, thank you. Andrea, do you want to take this up? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one, one sign of progress, of course, is um, the people uh, who have been brought into the administration. And so we look at, you know, people like Vanita Gupta, who's an ACLU lawyer, uh, headed up the uh, Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, who's coming in, and the Justice Department, Kristen Clark from the Lawyers Committee. Uh, even the sister of Vice President Harris is an ACLU executive director. Uh, from California, not, you know, of course, not obviously with the policy portfolio, um, but I think they're very important influences. Uh, also, frankly, um, you know, the power that the president has to accomplish anything is on, on his agenda uh, is due to the two senators that were elected from Georgia. Uh, and so we see good signs that they are listening to them. Um, these, these senators in particular, of course, Raphael Warnock is someone uh, who has a 
you know, decades long record of working for criminal justice reform, opening up his church to record expungements, working using, you know, working for um, voter registration and voter participation. Uh, and so I think we, you know, I think that they have a great deal of leverage, which they seem uh, quite willing to use uh, to essentially, and, and, this, and this is the message that, you know, I know advocates have given to them and they understand very clearly that they will not be reelected uh, if they don't deliver on the promises that were made, um, like the $2,000 COVID relief checks and so forth. So uh, I think for us, um, you know, the, one of the most important priorities uh, is, uh, you know, is voting rights legislation. And, you know, we'll have more, we can go more in depth uh, on that later in the program. But, you know, what, but essentially uh, without, uh, without voting rights legislation, uh, minority rule will begin to take hold um, in the United States. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the COVID package, uh, because Black and Brown people have been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Uh, and there's got to be a race equity lens on how, um, how this relief is administered. Uh, and, and that is not yet. That is still not happening. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Johnetta, what have you, from your perspective, especially on the policing issue, what would you say you've seen so far or heard? And what would you say the priorities are? Uh, I will repeat what Mike said. Actually, it is so early, so haven't really heard much. But again, I'm giving grace because it is like, I mean, how long has it been? So I also know that yesterday there was, or was it today? Yesterday there was a meeting with um, gun violence survivors at the White House. Mm -hmm. And so that is interesting to me. I'm interested in what's happening with gun violence and policing. Um, I definitely see both of those things as connected especially connected issues here in America. Um, so it was positive for me because I saw not only people that I know participate in that meeting, but I can physically reach out and ask like, how was the, what's the temperature? Like, are they interested? Were they serious? Um, and so that is something that's different than the last four years of what we've been experiencing being shut out of the White House. Great, and, and Joey, what is your take on how act, activists, human rights defenders around the world, what's the feeling in terms of there being a new administration in the United States and what that means for them? I would say the most important or significant change that was brought by the new administration would be their intention to construct a global democratic alliance that would require joint efforts from different countries, from different stakeholders, from different organizations that we coordinate an effort to defend the human rights and also freedoms of not only the people of Hong Kong, not only the Uyghurs community, not only the Tibetans community, but then also all those who are under suppression of the regime from China, from Russia, and from the other tyrannies. And I would say that is the biggest change that, 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 that I've seen from this administration. And I feel pretty optimistic about that because when it comes to the case of Hong Kong, we all know that when you talk about defending human rights and freedoms in Hong Kong, we can never escape from the broader China, China challenge or the broader China question. So to counter the rise of China or to counter the very aggressive expansion of China. It, it, it does really require the joint efforts by a multilateral coalition or a multilateral alliance that would re unite and also to, to, to join the efforts from different countries, from multilateral organizations. So I would say that is the most optimistic thing that I've heard from the administration. And we're really looking forward to the construction and also to the future plans of this coalition. Great. That's a great overview. Thank you all. Um, I want to dig in on something that Andrea raised, which is voting rights. That's about, it's the heart of democratic practice that people are able to express their views through their vote. Um, we saw a massive turnout in the 2020 elections, as well as enormous controversy about voter suppression, election infrastructure, and other issues that, like gerrymandering, racial gerrymandering, and the role of money in politics. So um, Andrea, if you could kick us off, what should the voting rights agenda be? What, what would you say is, what are you looking to see? 
Well, um, you know, there is HR one, there are, you know, there is legislation that uh, passed the house and, and, you know, would pass it again with no problem in the new Congress um, that would uh, put in place things like automatic, some of the things that were in place in Georgia, uh, automatic voter registration, um, same, same day registration, which we don't have, but which many states have, uh, have passed even as constitutional amendments. Uh, other kinds of protections, some of the most important now being pre-clearance. So in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down the pre-clearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act um, in, in a quite a cynical way, because not to say that there was no longer racial discrimination in the application of the voting laws, but to say the formula was outdated. And so uh, voter suppression was no longer just a problem of the South, not that, you know, was not particularly a problem of the South, what, but is actually now a problem of anywhere uh, there are Black voters who are in a position uh, to elect the candidates uh, that, that support them and their issues and concerns. So in Georgia alone right now, there are maybe as many as 40 bills, I say maybe because uh, I just got a call from my political director and yesterday a bill, a 48-page 48, 48 bill was dropped that would have affected every aspect of uh, how people vote in Georgia, um, eliminating mail-in voting, um, for example, uh, which 1.3 million Georgians used uh, in November. Uh, so there are, and this is happening across, you know, across the country, uh, especially, you know, it must be said, in Republican-controlled legislators, legislatures. There are hundreds of bills uh, to make it more difficult for an American citizen. And I sort of have to really have to emphasize this is that we're talking about eligible voters, American citizens who are eligible to vote uh, and barriers are being uh, attempted uh, to make it more difficult for those people to, to participate in our democracy. And of course it falls on lower income Americans. It falls on Af uh, Americans of color uh, to, to make it less fair and, and more difficult. Um, so we have a real, and on top of that, we have a crisis. Uh, the former president uh, spent, the, you know, thank, basically four years, uh, maybe five years, uh, you know, telling lies about the electoral system in America um, that intensified, uh, you know, after uh, the electoral loss that, uh, that he experienced. And so, um, we really, it's really, really critical that we restore the Voting Rights Act uh, and that we invest in election uh, in the mechanisms for hosting free and fair and transparent elections in the United States. Yeah. You know, Mike, I want to turn this to you and, and ask you specifically about the example that the United States sets. So Andrea just raised that we've heard um, the former president talk about really a, a story, a conspiracy about this election being rigged, when that happens in the United States, what does that mean for other democracies and their voting systems? You're on mute, Mike. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, it's a great question, one we really think a lot about at Freedom House, because, uh, you know, we've been tracking the this, you know, the decline really of, of, of democracy around the globe. Uh, and really, I think it really underscores for us how important the US example is, as you say. You know, we're not Pollyannish about the US history, you know, with slavery, Jim Crow, you know, foreign policy mistakes like the Iraq war. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot that, you know, has not been great about our democracy. But I think we are a resilient uh, country, and we, uh, you know, we're constantly aspiring uh, to to reach our ideals. You know, as within the civil, during the civil rights movement, or in, or in other cases. And so, I think people around the country, people around the world, rather, really look at what's happening in the United States. We know this because we work with, you know, human rights activists like Joey in in countries all over the world, in in Belarus and. Hong Kong and uh, you know Zimbabwe, uh, Ethiopia, and and they really pay very close attention to what's happening in the United States. Now I think that it's a little bit of a a, a double-edged story, if you will. On the one hand, there's no question that there's been a bad 
uh, uh, impact from some of the, uh, you know, from some of the what's going on in our country. I'll give you like one example. You know, I, I, our former president popularized the word fake news uh, and as, as a way of kind of denigrating the news media. So what had happened in the last four years, you know, dozens of countries have imposed uh, restrictions, you know, unjustifiable restrictions on free expression, on journalists in the name of combating fake news. On the other hand, I do think we have to kind of not go overboard. You know, what's happening in our country uh, as you know, troublesome as it is sometimes, you know, it's not like what's happening in China or Russia, uh, Turkey, you know, where journalists are being thrown in jail, where, uh, you, know, you know, opponents are being murdered, uh, where human rights activists are being tortured. We have to kind of keep it, you know, in some perspective about this. And one thing I think about the events is, since January 6th is that to me, it's a tale of uh, uh, problems, but also American resiliency, right? The system, the system held. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the former president uh, tried to basically overturn the democratically, uh, uh, the democratic results of our election, and he failed. You know, dozens of courts uh, rejected his baseless claims. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Congress uh, ratified the results. And, uh, you know, even Senator McConnell, you know, in his uh, comments on the Senate floor last weekend, you know, really made it clear how reprehensible the president's actions were in the lead up to January 6th. So I'm a little scared that we came kind of so close to, to, to kind of trouble, but I also feel that at the end of the day, you know, the system held, and that kind of gives me hope for the future. I think we can't only be pessim pessimistic about what happened here. We have to be hopeful. Well, I, I agree with you, and I, I want to turn to our grass, our frontline activists, because if anything should give us hope for the future, there's been this rise of autocratic governments, but there has also been a rise in the level of resistance. And we've seen people take to the streets to practice democracy like never before for peaceful, nonviolent social change. And so, Johnetta and Joey, I want to turn this to you. You have been on these front lines. You have been making your voices heard. And it's what gives institute, democratic institutions the strength and the will to do the right thing for democracy. Um, what are you say, what are you thinking the priorities of the grassroots movements will be in the next four years? And Janet, I'll start with you. I know for myself and my colleagues at Campaign Zero, our main concerns are, well, my personal concerns. I believe in organizing from the ground up. I believe in engaging from the ground up. So I love seeing so many people engage with our work from a city and state level. Um, we've, doing, we've been doing a lot of local work with um, city council members or legislators or uh, the aldermen in local cities to get, our, to get our proposals in front of them and saying, hey, we've done pretty much all the legwork for you. Here's the legislation, look it over. And then moving that forward um, because we found like with our campaign Nix the Six last summer, that was one of the biggest um, tra transformations of policing across the country um, with just those six provisions, removing those from police union contracts. We've been doing volunteer work with multiple, like maybe 300 or 400 people across the country right now, um, teaching them how to actually read their local city council uh, agreements with police or reading whatever the state contract is with the police, um, but getting the actual police union contracts in front of people so you can see this is what's stopping you from actually getting justice. So we've been doing a lot of work in, in Louisville, Kentucky, um, where we are teaching people this is what, like, yes, the problem is that they were allowed to break into their house unannounced and shoot and kill Breonna Taylor. Here is what caused that. Here are the provisions that prevent us from getting actual justice with these three police officers that were on trial last summer. Um, and it's just been interesting watching everything click for people, uh, meeting people where they are. A lot of people are not showing up as policy experts. So teaching them that language, sharing knowledge with people, um, so people are not, are not, aren't, aren't doing this work blindfolded and just feeling around like we were six, seven years ago in Ferguson. Um, so really it's just all about trying to actually show up and be a, a resource and a support for people. 
I, I mean, I, I, that gives me such hope because that is democracy. You are helping people participate in democracy, which is, it's really- it's COVID um, safe, because we can't come to cities and I, I'm a fan of teachings and I love like a good workshop and I can't do that right now because it's not safe. So right. getting 20 and 30 people on a Zoom, that is safe and we can do that easily from people wherever they are. Folks come and they are folding laundry on these calls. It does not matter. I just need you to show up, you know? So it's great. Yeah. Great. Joey, um, what, are, what are you seeing as the priorities in Hong Kong and among your colleagues but, uh, for grassroots activism? Where do you see it going in this era? Well, actually, ever since the pro-democracy struggle in Hong Kong broke out in 2019, we have witnessed the unprecedented excessive use of lethal weapons in Hong Kong. Like we have the police firing tear gases, rubber bullets, using pepper spray and life rounds within such a short distance to not only protesters, but then also to elderly in the city, to pregnant women, to also those everyday citizens who simply walked by. And I think Hong Kongers did witness the kind of police brutality ongoing in the city. And also they had the firsthand experience of like how police brutality feels like and why are the other protesters in the other countries protesting against that. And with so many people from different backgrounds, from different age groups, with different jobs and knowledge, we, we, we felt like we have already built the kind of momentum in Hong Kong to protest against political brutality and also more broadly the encroachments and also atrocities from the Chinese Communist Party. And I think for the next four years, because the national security law in Hong Kong was implemented in July 2020, and that really gives us a very great limitation where we can no longer go out to the streets to protest, to organize assemblies or political gatherings. We can't even express our views online when, when you're in Hong Kong, because that would lead you to being charged in a subversion, secession, or colluding with foreign forces. So I would say the thing that the grassroots organizations can do right now in Hong Kong is pretty limited, but then we are still trying to explore ways and how can we sustain the movement to maintain the kind of momentum that we built since 2019, and also to pass on the knowledge and to try to educate or simply to speak to people who used to disagree with us because well that is not violating the national security law but then that is also making a change because by doing that we might be able to change somebody's mind and after they have changed their mind they might be able to pass on the word to their community to their neighborhood to their to their household so that is the thing that Hong, those people who are still in Hong Kong trying to do and for people who are outside of Hong Kong for example for activists overseas like me or the other protesters who are now seeking asylum in different countries. We're also trying to establish different diaspora organizations. We are trying to spread the word in our local community. We're trying to speak to people in the other countries to tell them what has been going on in Hong Kong. What is Hong Kong? What are the cultures of Hong Kong? And in what ways can you help Hong Kong? And I think that that kind of like grassroots communication and interaction is really, really crucial when it comes to build and also to raise a public awareness and also to put enough pressure to our local legislators to push for a concrete policy change. So I would say that is the priority for us to continue to spread the word, to build solidarity. And I think that would be the thing that we all focus on in the next four years. Great, thank you. And the Hong Kong protesters were really just an inspiration to people who advocate for rights around the world and the bravery and the courage that you all showed is just amazing. And um, so thank you for inspiring us. So I'm gonna shift gears. This program, this conversation we're having today is happening during Black History Month. And Jill, if, if I could, I, I, I did wanna say something about the impact of the, of the activism in the United States, Please. just quickly. So I yeah. think it's really important. One of the stories that we've not heard from Georgia yet uh, is the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on, uh, on elections for district attorney, for sheriff, across the state, in the sub suburbs of Atlanta, in, in, in Savannah, in Augusta, in Athens. Um, and so it's important that this now be translated into the kind of policy change Jeanette is, was talking about. But I think we will, this, I mean, the, what 
but the efforts that have happened have had tremendous had a tremendous effect on the electoral outcome. Uh, and, and we are committed, and I, I think we've been in touch with some of your colleagues, Janetta, uh, to talk about how we you know, translate the policy so that we, we, we sort of had this campaign, uh, hope, vote, advocate. So you know, people had the hope for change, they voted. We are now in the advocacy and accountability. We've already, and, and these were multicultural, multiracial coalitions. So, um, you know, the impact of, of these young people has been tremendous and we owe, them a, we owe them a debt of gratitude for saving democracy in America in 2020. So I just, yeah, I, I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you for saying that. I think it is really important that you galvanize around one issue, but it has a, an, an amplified effect on voting on other issues, on just getting people engaged in the process of democracy and advocacy no matter where they enter. And I, I think it can't be underscored enough. Um, I don't know, did anyone wanna, yes, I was gonna say, Johnetta, do you wanna respond? I do just wanna shout out um, Ms. Andrea's colleague, Christopher Bruce. I just sent you a, a little message, but we've been doing a lot of work with Christopher Bruce of the ACLU down in Georgia, actually on some policy and legislation we're trying to put forward in Georgia. So yes, the work is happening in Georgia indeed. Like it is incredible. What's happening in Georgia is never something that I could have imagined. Um, my mom lived in Marietta for like six months at one point in my life. Um, so it's just like the Georgia today is not the Georgia in the 90s when my mom lived there. And that is amazing. Yeah, Mike. Uh, Jill, I just want to say you know, how inspired I am by people like Janetta and Joey. And I just think the one thing I'd want to say just from a global perspective, uh, you know, there's a real demand for freedom and democracy among people. I mean, the fact that, you know, last summer, I think, Joe, if I'm correct, two or three million, you know, people in Hong Kong were out on the streets demanding their rights. You know, every Sunday in Belarus, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, are protesting, you know, Europe's last dictator, as, uh, as, as the leader of uh, Belarus is called, and, uh, you know, against really you know, terrible violence that's being perpetrated against the organizers of those protests. Uh, it's happening uh, uh, in Africa, in Sudan. Uh, you know, Jill, you and I worked on the issue of Sudan, and we know that, you know, 10 years ago, I would never have thought that Omar al-Bashir would be on his way to the ICC, but there was a people protest in Sudan that, you know, led to the deposing of that dictator. So the fact is, is that, you know, nonviolent resistance- Russia. Is, is, and Russia too, absolutely. And the point is that nonviolent uh, resistance is really very much alive in our country. And I think we have to, as individuals, appreciate the you know the the power that's being brought against against our comrades around the world. And so we really have to you know you know be standing up for their you know for their for their freedom. And I think you know one of the most important things that leaders in the United States can do, if you ask like what can you do. Is to, is to really speak out on behalf of the people who are suffering. Because, you, know, you know, as Ellie Wiesel once said, you know, silence only aims, you know, aids the, uh, uh, the perpetrator, not the victim. And so we can't be silent. Great, thank you. Um, it's a good segue into the racial justice question where I think we're seeing people become more vocal at this moment in history than I've seen in, in, in a long time where people are, are recognizing the fact that we live in a very unjust country in America and that around the world, as, as Mike has said and Joey referenced, minority groups are being targeted as never before. So, you know, it's, I run a history museum and we talk about uh, civil rights history, which was trying to help America live up to its promises of democracy and there are so many issues still related to racial justice that are on the work is just not done. The criminal justice, as Andrea mentioned before, the disparate impact of COVID, access to education, wealth disparities. So if we focus on racial justice for a minute, where is the best place for us to focus our energies in the near term? Johnetta, let's start with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. On racial justice in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you come from, you work on the police brutality issue. Is that, would you say the pri priority to address on racial justice issues? Is that where you would start? 
Uh, for me personally, yes, that's where I would start. But I'm also interested in so many other things. St. Louis has incredible Cori Bush in Congress right now. So she is a fellow protester. This is incredible. I never ever thought that one of us would be in Congress. So being able to reach out to literally a Congress person and say, hey, can we talk about an activist table where we talk about the needs of St. Louis City and St. Louis County and that actually being realized, happening and planned, that's really wild. No one, we never would have thought that happened seven years ago. Um, and so that's also the importance for me of turning protest into policy or protest into tangible things that actually bring about change and results. So I'm super excited to work with Corey, super excited um, to work with other, like Tashara, Tashara Jones in St. Louis City is running for mayor of St. Louis City. Um, I'm super excited about just this new fresh energy that's happening in St. Louis and in Missouri in general. Uh, and so that's where my focus is, like everything, the holistic person trying to make Black St. Louis whole. That's my priority. It includes policing. It also includes poverty, food deserts, schooling, um, and the list goes on. Yeah. Andrea, turn it over to you. Racial justice agenda. I think from the standpoint, the question is sort of how the center can be sort of a platform. Is that your direction? Then I, th I think actually the kind of thing that exactly what you know Janetta is talking about. I think the center, you know, um, we have the exhibit on on um, the Voting Rights Act, the, the 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 March for the Voting Rights Act. I think I was not talking about the center. I was saying not the center in general, just in general. Racial justice agenda. In yeah. General. Well, I do that? think the racial justice agenda in general really is still around voting. I mean, Dr. King said, "Give us the ballot." And I think, you know, Cori Bush is a tremendous example of that, uh, of this generation of activists going now into policy making provisions, positions. And I think, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, we've made a decision to focus on voting rights at the ACLU of Georgia because in a democracy, uh, the ballot is your currency. And that that is what you use to set the priorities that you want for your community. And so I think when we have a responsive participatory democracy, then the rest of these things can be, um, the rest of these things can be worked through. You know, we, we don't, we, we're, you know, some of the policies we see, you know, the difficulty in, you can't enact policies that are actually popular in America, like a $15 minimum wage like universal health insurance, like universal child care, like quality funding for our schools. You know, these are popular with the maj overwhelming majority of the American people, but because we don't really have a full democracy, they don't make their way into policy. Um, and so for me, that, that remain from, you accomplish that and the rest of it, can then follow because how you divide the pie, how you set your priorities should be based on, you know, the priorities of the American people. And that's still, and even in terms of international policy, you know, most Americans would have the United States be far more engaged in a, in a positive and constructive way in the world, give much more to, um, for, you know, to international assistance, uh, do much more in terms of you know, building up the, uh, the the example of the State Department uh, as a, a force for good and not just, you know, something that protects uh, corporate interests around the world. And so, you know, we, you know, Jimmy Carter used to talk about a government as good as the American people. Uh, and, you know, and I think that's still what, um, what we, uh, you know, what should be our priority. And, and I think voting is one of the, the fundamental levers to then accomplishing the rest of the agenda. Yeah, I'll just, I'll ask our other panelists from an international perspective, minority rights and the role the US can play in protecting minority rights around the world. Do you wanna weigh in on that from the international perspective? Mike? Okay, I'll, uh, uh, well, first of all, let me just say I, would, would really agree with Andrea about the putting the focus on voting rights. I think that would be our perspective uh, at Freedom House, just, just as a, a preface to this. And I think, uh, I guess two other points that I would say that's interesting. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of the hour 
that Freedom House does this annual report every year called Freedom in the World, in which we analyze the level of political rights and civil liberties uh, in every country in the world. And so we kind of have a global perspective on this. And I certainly think that, you know, one of the things we've seen over the last uh, 10 years has been kind of a slow erosion of the quality of US democracy. Now I would say in the big picture, we're still a very free country. And I think we have a lot to be proud of in terms of respecting rights and liberties. But I think we also have to be honest that there's been uh, a decline. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that this issue that you spotlighted, Jill, of inequality is something that is really emerges as an area that has not really been properly you know, addressed in US democracy. It's, we certainly made some progress, but, it's, but we're not going in, a, in the right direction. So I think you're right to kind of put the finger on that. But I think the other thing I would add, just as your question uh, alluded to, is that globally, you know, we really see a lot of intense persecution of, of minority groups. And sadly, you know, governments have kind of turned to uh, kind of scapegoating the other. Uh, as part of their effort to uh, stay in power. And I would say, you know, two examples that I would cite, you know, number one would be India, the world's most populous democracy, which has really, if you look at our reports and other people's reports over the last number of years, has really uh, ha uh, adopted policies that, uh, you know, can really be seen as uh, antagonistic towards the, the Muslim minorities uh, in, in India. And then the country that has really, I think, practiced the, the, you know, the, great, the most egregious violations of, of, of minority rights is, is China, uh, obviously with Tibet, but really most notably uh, uh, in recent years with uh, the Uyghurs and other Muslim groups in Western China, with I think close to 2 million uh, uh, Uyghurs who have been put into, uh, you know, quote unquote, re-education camps. Uh, it is really probably you know, in my mind, the most egregious human rights violation in the world right now, and something that I hope that uh, people of conscience will really be speaking out more and more over the next couple of years. Yeah, and, and on that, just segueing into Joey about, you know, looking at the situation of the Uyghurs and what you managed to do with the Hong Kong protests, are there ways to work those other issues in China into the agenda? Yeah, I think there are there are a lot to be done by this government. So first of all, maybe I'll start by talking about what, what has been happening in the US. So recently, because of COVID, because of the deterioration of the US sino relationship, we see a lot of hate crimes against Asian communities happening in the US, but then we do not see a strong enough response from the government. We do not see a strong enough response from the legislators or the civic society. So that should be something that we, that we have to work on. We see Thais, we see Koreans, we see Hong Kongers, we see Japanese, we see Chinese being attacked randomly on the streets, but then we do not see any concrete policies coming to protect them. And that should be highlighted and that should be something that we have to work on in the next four years and, and also in the future. And talking about the attacks against Asian communities here in the US, and I think that also goes back to the broader China question where the Chinese Communist Party has been trying to dominate the whole Asian community by projecting the voices of only Ch Chinese Han communities, but then neglecting and suppressing the voices of Uyghurs, Tibetans, Koreans, Japanese, Hong Kongers. And I think that should also be something that we really have to focus on. We have to do something more to project the voices of Japanese, Koreans, Hong Kongers, and the other Asian groups here in the US and also across the globe. And we have also seen the Chinese Communist Party categorizing Uyghurs as terrorists, te categorizing Tibetans as separatists, and even now more recently categorizing all the Hong Kongers in Hong Kong as separatists or those who are trying to overthrow the Chinese Communist regime. So I think in that way, the US should really be doing something more to voice out for these people. So for example, they, they, the previous administration, they one of the one of the good decisions that they made is about recognizing the Uyghur genocide. And I think in that terms, that is a very, very important step in terms of raising global awareness and also to encourage our international allies and also pay attention to the issue, to recognize the issue, and also to formulate policies on top of the foundation. Foundation. And I think that should be the focus and also priority for us. Great. Thank you so much. 
I'm going to um, open it up to some of the questions that we have in the chat, and I invite other people who are listening in to write your questions in the in the chat. Um, so uh, how can the US help in the fight for freedom and human rights when many of its allies abroad are authoritarian regimes with little tolerance for human rights and freedom? And I can go to any of you who want to yeah, say yeah, something about that, that, but I know Mike will want to say something about that. Well, it's a great question. Again, if you look at the Freedom House scores over the last uh, 10 years, what's really kind of remarkable is that you've seen pretty dramatic democratic erosion in uh, some very strong US allies. I mean, first of all, you start with a country like Saudi Arabia, which uh, is a strong ally, it's never been particularly free, but you know, it's, it's not a situation, it's still pretty grim for human rights uh, activists and for journalists, as we've seen from the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, you also have seen countries like uh, the Philippines, uh, Hungary, Turkey, Poland. I mean, these are strong uh, American allies historically that have really seen quite setbacks in, in human rights. And so, you know, this is a matter of diplomacy. You know, we have other interests with these countries and, and we recognize that, that, uh, that you're not always going to be able to uh, uh, get everything you want on human rights. But I think what's important is that you state what your values and principles are. And I think what we've seen from at least what, what, what I'm encouraged about early on from the Biden administration is that at least in their statements and in, you know, the, you know they've made it clear, uh, you know, their basically fundamental values about human rights and democracy. And I think that's really important, making clear, you know, you know where you stand and making cl clear that that is a part of the bilateral relationship. And that, by the way, the onus is not just on the United States to make that relationship strong. It's also on the other countries uh, to also, you know, to, 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 to do things that are necessary, you know, to build a strong relationship with the United States and that, that they should be understanding that, that we do care about things like freedom of the press or freedom of expression or the treatment of minority groups, that these are really important parts of our, of our values and that we are going to stand up for that. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful so far, but, uh, but we will see how it goes. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, another question is, how can policymakers mainstream civil and human rights learning into a, re a renewed U.S. Um, civic education of social studies, public school, elementary curriculum? How do we start to mainstream these ideas about civil and human rights into curricular materials for young people is the question. We may have lost Andrea. I don't know, Janetta, if you would feel comfortable taking that one up. Yeah, I would say it's really all about, for me, um, the, the leader in the classroom is the teacher. So it's all about what the teacher values, in my opinion. Um, when I learned Black history or anything related to Black people in grade school, going to all white private Catholic schools, it was bare minimum, you know? And now I'm seeing um, my friends who are teachers, Black male teachers, Black female teachers, um, pouring into their students and feeding them the history as it is written um, and not you know the whitewashed version of a story so i've been seeing a lot especially black history month i've been seeing so many little black little black babies learning about like tulsa for the first time and like being told that story at six and seven and i can't even imagine what that would have done for my own psyche if i was six and seven learning truth in that in that way versus um, I think the way we started Black history in our in our schools was like talking about Martin Luther King at the Civil Rights March. So it was like, oh, the country has been around for this long, but Black people and civil rights only started in the 60s. Got you. Like that just never made sense, even at nine and 10. Um, so it is good to see like Black folks teaching our babies the truth from the beginning. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of white teachers and we've been interacting with a lot of white teachers back at home, especially um, who want to have like reading book lists or do we have like a suggested book list or, you know, just looking for what black people would teach their children. And I think that's also a great way to go about being a good ally for our children, for our students, um, being invested in their future by being invested in their history as well. Yeah, great. 
Thank you. And at the center, we have a, a project called Truth and Transformation that tries to put in context the current moment because it didn't arrive out of nowhere. It is the product of a whole history, civil rights history since the founding of the country and even before that with Native American peoples of to actually have a true narrative of what has happened to understand what this moment is. Um, so I wanna go to another question. Uh, what kind of support would your organizations need to be able to go head to head with the people running local state provincial or national governments. Um, so I guess they're asking for skills or assistance needed among activists. This is to, I guess all of you, you're all human rights defenders, um, to have the confidence and the ability to take on legislative campaigns. For Joey and Janetta, are there things you need as frontline organizations? Joey? Yeah, perhaps I will start first. So. Ever since 2019, there have been a bunch of Hong Kongers, Hong Kong activists, Hong Kong protesters who were forced into exile and now settling down in different countries across the globe. And they are very new to the society, to the community. And also they are very new in terms of establishing diaspora communities organization that will actually work on policy change. So I think the one thing that is very important and, and one of the very important resources that we can provide to them or the government can provide to them is about education on how does the local government work how does the state government work how does the how does the whole governmental structure runs and who should we be talking to who should we be reaching out to when we want to talk to the legislator talk to a policy maker who actually formulates those policies and i think that is the thing that civil organizations that are already so well established here in the u.s can be doing and also that should also be another focus of the u.s government in terms of how to assist these newcomers not only from hong kong but then also from the other places in terms of how to project their voices and to make their voices important when it comes to formulating policy that will actually affect them. And I think that is a thing that we should all try and help to provide to them. Yeah, great. Janetta, do you want to add anything to that? No, that was it. <laughs> Get a great job. Um, there's another question about uh, social media and the role of free speech, freedom of speech, but also social media being used by repressive governments to silence voices. I want to folks weigh in on how social media has been helping to promote human rights, but also how you see it being used as a tool to restrict human rights. Mike, could I start with you on that? Sure, thank you, Joe. Well, I think you kind of said it in, your, in, the, in the nature of your question. It's a real mixed bag out there. I think still of you know, when kind of Facebook exploded into the scene in 2011, when it was kind of used as a tool of, organi of organization for the, uh, for the protesters in, uh, in, in Tahrir Square in Egypt. And, you know, that organizing led to the downfall of the dictator uh, in Egypt. And, you know, everyone at the same time was saying, everyone at the time was saying, well, this is like the future. And of course, what happened is the bad guys, you know, figured out how to exploit social media. And so, you know, one of the things, for instance, about Jamal Khashoggi, who was, you know, murdered by the uh, Saudis in Turkey, and there'll be an important report, hopefully next week from the US government about that. But, uh, but, what, but what I was struck by is that there was really Twitter mobs that the, uh, that the Saudi government unleashed against Khashoggi to try to uh, uh, really intimidate him. And I, I was quite struck by the way Khashoggi described it in an interview before he died about he really kind of was uh, tormented by waking up every morning and seeing like just people just, you know, hundreds of people, you know, attacking him. It, it, we, I think we really underestimate the kind of impact that these kind of mobs can have on like women journalists or other minority groups. I mean, of course, we also have to protect free speech, I mean, legitimate free speech, but, you know, uh, you know, an effort to incite genocide or violence against people, that's, you know, that's not protected even by our First Amendment. So I think, you know, I think we got to get the balance right. Yeah. Others, uh, organizers weighing in on social media or um, Andrea, we're talking about social media as a, a boon to civil rights and human rights advocacy, but also as a tool that can be used against human rights advocates. Um, 
Yeah, it's a particular challenge. You know, of course, the ACLU is a, is a, is a free speech, you know, First Amendment organization. And, you know, really what we consider to be free speech now are gains that were won because of the civil rights movement of the 60s, right? The right to the right to, pro to nonviolent protest uh, and so forth, the right to you know, belong to the NAACP without being fired from your job as a teacher. Um, so these are very important protections, uh, but the internet and, and the way that um, uh, disinformation is spread for profit is something that needs to be examined. Um, you know, there was a time before Ronald Reagan when you know the public airways there were there were standards uh you couldn't get on television and just and lie nonstop for an hour and you know i think frankly now we have a several media outlets that that is their business model you have a bit social media's business model is you know that is all about making money from uh things that you know from viral information which is all often misinformation and so i think you know, to examine that is not to is not to be against free speech. I think we need to ask these questions. You're not allowed to to shout fire in a crowded theater, uh, and I think we we're, there are many instances in which that is happening on, on social media to the great detriment uh, of uh, of our democracy. Yeah, we we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to just do a lightning round. People are always interested in what they can do. If you could. Give one piece of advice to people about how they can support civil and human rights, promote them, protect them, do whatever they can. What would be your advice to people? And uh, Janetta, I'm gonna start with you. Good, because I have a quick answer. So if you're looking for information on how to engage your local police departments to learn what provisions are even in their contracts, I suggest, especially if you are a white person, I truly suggest that you email them call them, ask them to send you a copy of their police union contract, and then you send that to me and we can have a conversation about it. We can organize around it, whatever you wanna do. But that's one of my favorite activities, especially for allies who want to be actual allies and active allies. That's something quick, fast and easy you can do. And they can go to Campaign Zero to get in touch with you? Yes. Okay. Joey, Sue, what would you recommend people if they want to get involved? And it's very simple because as I have just said, there are so many new Hong Kong diaspora communities across the globe. Just get in touch with them, contact them. And, and I'm sure they really need a lot of help from the local community. So just join them, contact them, participate in their panels, participate in discussions related to Hong Kong. And there are still protests going on in different cities on the 31st of August and every important day for Hong Kong. So just join those rallies, join those protests. The protests are really, really crucial in terms of putting pressure on the legislators and also in raising public awareness. So I do encourage you to get in touch with them or if you don't know how to contact them, feel free to email me or to DM me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and I'm more than happy to help. Thank you. Andrea. Uh, well, of course, uh, go to aclu.org, uh, <laughs> sign up. Uh, we, we have any number of ways uh, for people to get involved on a whole range of civil rights and civil liberties issues. And I would say contribute become a member, become engaged in, you know, some organization and there are great examples here on this panel. Um, and also send money. One of the things about the internet is what we've discovered is the power of small contributions. So if you can send $5 to, you know, Campaign Zero, you know, do it. Uh, because those things have added up. And, and part of why we could do the things we did in Georgia is because, frankly, our grassroots organizations had the money to pay organizers uh, and to do the work and go into their own communities and talk to the members of their own communities about uh, how we can transform the, the way that we live. So, uh, you know, just get it, pick something and get involved. Yeah. And Mike, I'm going to give you the last word as our partner on this. What can people do? Well, three things uh, that I'll just come to the top of my mind. Uh, go to www.freedomhouse.org and uh, you know, sign up for one of our newsletters, our mailing list. We have in just uh, two weeks, the release of Freedom of the World 2021, which is really gonna be an important report. We're gonna follow that up in a few weeks with a special report about US democracy. So really eager for people to, re to see our content. 
I'll always say, Jill, you know me, please donate to these great organizations. Uh, we, we can't do it without the support of individuals. And so really appreciate that support. And then the final thing going back to the comment I made at the beginning is speak out. Uh, I think that the more people make it clear that they're not happy with the status quo, with these egregious human rights violations, with these violations of civil rights, the better. And, and politicians everywhere need to know that people care about these issues, that these are not just nice to have things, but they're important to have. Great. Thank you so much to all our panelists. This has been a great program. Um, thank you all for tuning in. And please go to all those websites, sign up for these to keep it, the conversation going. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Jill, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're still, are we still on? Are we live? I'll okay. call you later. That's okay. recording. Thank you. Anyway, Andrew, thank nice, you all. Andrew, nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice, to, nice meet to meet you, with you and All of you. Right. Okay, take care. Take Goodbye. Care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.